Yeah, that goes crazy. Talk. Yeah. One, two, one, two. One, Yo, it's 8 o'clock, and we're on live and direct. I'm not on yet. Good. All right. And go in the back. And maybe you can do that. I mean, you can close the hand. Right, exactly. So you can stay back there because you can be our, our ears. Hakeem Green, channel live, live and direct. BBP all day, every day. You already know I represent that anti-industry movement. Big shout out to my boy Divine, Robin Gay, what's going on? I got my man Rozell behind the boards. Working it out, working it out, working it out. This is week two of Say That. And what we're going to do this week is say that loud and clear. My name is Hakeem Green once again, and we're going to get right into the mix. Today we are here at FP Youth Outcry, which is a youth, a youth center in Newark, New Jersey. My homeboy Al Tariq Best is doing some great work with young folks out here in Newark, New Jersey. And he invited us in to come, you know, do our shoot this week in his humble abode, but he's doing such great work. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just so happy to be here. Um, this week's conversation is the power of social media and how it translates in the hood. So it's so apropos that we are here, smack dab, in the hood of the bricks, North New Jersey. Big shout out to everybody here in North New Jersey. You know I got love for you. So, our conversation, social media, and how it translates in the hood, we have two very important guests who are gracious enough to come out here and share some time with me. First off, we have Dash from Undeniable TV. What's up, Dash? Chill, chill, man. How are you doing here? Yeah, man. Y'all know Dash put it down with all these young hip hop cats out here laying down that groundwork, all the battle rappers. He's out there collecting all that content, getting y'all popping on his YouTube channel and his um his dot net. Coming out the TV dot net. Yes, sir. Getting it in, getting it in, getting it in, laying it down, doing some great work. So I'm so happy that you can make it down and join this conversation. We also have the big homie BG the Prophet. Yeah, man, my Facebook homie. You know what I mean? This is this brother right here. Created a, a magnificent vehicle called StarForceHipHop.com, and uh, you know he's been keeping it real with me in a big way, in a major way. Um, you know when I put stuff out, you know he always treats me right. He puts the stuff up, he gives me that look that he needs. And, you know he gets it out to the masses. And you got like a lot of people checking for your site, but I think that's a wonderful thing. So you know it's, it's real good that you can come all the way out from your hometown of Long Island to share some time with us here in Northern New Jersey and have this conversation. Now, social media is like the craze. It's like the way. It's, it's the new hustle, so to speak, in a lot of ways. And because of the internet, because of digital media, uh, social media, you know, the big conglomerates, the record labels, they're like shaking in their boots because we got young cats who are making use of these, these platforms and doing some huge numbers via their work on social media. So we want the experts to come in and chime in and kind of talk about their history. Dash, first off, just tell us, our audience, a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the social media game and how it's added to your whole movie. Basically, uh, on the night TV, I uh, started it in think, late 2008, basically to have that, that media forum for New Jersey to create that, that media outlet for New Jersey just watching the whole internet platform and just watching different states and seeing what they was doing. I didn't, I didn't think we had that, that viral campaign that we needed. So coming up, I just chose certain avenues and certain things that I was going to do. So you know, I definitely did the, the political, uh, the uh, community, just all different topics. So when you look at Undeniable, you, you can't deny the content. You can't really put it in a box. So you'll see You'll see political figures, you'll see uh, funeral home directors, you'll see youth organizations, you'll see uh, mass, you'll see so many different things. Just putting in different content, different people, different stories, and putting it up on all one form. So that's basically what I created with Unlimited TV. Mm -hmm. And the same for you, uh, BG, like, you know, give us a little sense of your history in the game, the entertainment game, and how did you trans, uh, transform over to the social media game? 
basically, uh, I started off as a rapper and uh, coming up through the ranks, you know, becoming friendly with Ty Fife, um, Triple C, Sports for Maybach Music, Dump Play. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did construction. And one day I found myself playing Rick Ross's bodyguard at 600 Fence. Mm -hmm. And I happened to shoot the behind the scenes footage that day. Mm -hmm. I noticed right away that once I put it up, I'm going to I'm the only one that has the exclusivity of that specific set of footage. Mm -hmm. I had the website going like a week before that. I seen the power that the, the exclusivity of that type of footage had. Mm -hmm. And that was it. A month later, I got laid off. Mm -hmm. And that was it for construction. Six months later, I woke up saying to myself, I never have to work with no one ever again. Wow. And that was it. Basically, the platform for Star Wars hip hop, and, and you know, it's just the music and just the culture. You know, there's no drama, there's no fist fights. It, the talent has to be good. So I consider myself like one of the greatest talents guys. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but there's people I turn out every day because of visual quality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can tell, and then I'll put people up for free also. You know, you know. So you can tell when someone's grinding. They go crew what it's spent two to three grand on a set of music. Mm -hmm. you know, they might not know how to use it quite good yet, mm -hmm. but they can graduate to that level of data and drop it. You know. And um, pretty much that's it. Now we're one of the top ranked websites in the world. Mm -hmm. you know, we got 14,000 uh, per Alexa. Mm -hmm. And in the States, uh, this morning I woke up with 4,200. Mm -hmm. I just speak up a little bit softly. Mm -hmm. you know, but I'm mm -hmm. not. So with that said, um, you know, the website's growing fast, the bottom is growing fast. And I got my own uh, show coming out real soon, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's coming to the city. Yeah. So, wow, yeah. wow. It's going to be big. Yeah, okay, okay. So, Dad, talk about the different types of social media platforms that are available out there, like right? the Facebook, the Twitter, the Pinterest. Um, like, what are the different types? How can they be used? Can they be used? Are they relevant to the hood, the street? Is it a way to use these different avenues to propel your career? Definitely. Um, basically, all of the social media platforms are relevant to what you're trying to do or how you're trying to build your career. The most important thing you need to understand for making a transition from data media content to getting on these social networks, you have to understand uh, www.theworldwideweb. The web is, is worldwide. It, it, it's all around the world. So the content and the title is bigger than the conversation on the block. So understand the search engine optimization. That's understanding how do you make a title and how do you make your content resonate with the world. So if you got a slogan or something you're talking about in your environment, you gotta you gotta know the world is bigger than your environment. So the most important thing to your content and understanding search engine optimization, the most important thing to your video is the title. So when you throw that title to the world, that's what's gonna uh, give that title relevance. And that's what's going to give you a video. Because you look at Twitter, when you look at Facebook, they don't see your content. They don't see your content. They don't see the video right away. The one thing they do see is the title. So understanding search engine optimization, that allows you to see what words are relevant, what words are being used. If you look at um, one of the blogs that have on our website, or on the TV, it's called the Aftermath of Being About Their Life. And Tyrone Muhammad is a mortician. He's talking about the graphic details of what you see on your day-to-day -day journey as a mortician. So when you put that up, you can't really see, you can't really tag that mortician. Right. So when you understand being about oh, that right. life, that's what the kids resonate with. That's what they know. That's the, that's the word they use probably a million times a day. So what I did was took this content because I knew it was going to work being how graphic it was. Mm -hmm. So I took it from being a child that already had graphic. Mm -hmm. So that's the main things you want to know. Whether you're using Twitter, Facebook, you got to know how to connect with different people. If you understand Facebook, uh, I think it's like every 30 days if you don't communicate with somebody, you don't see their posts, you don't see theirs. So what is connecting you to these people? Whether it's hip hop, love, or whatever you do, uh, political activists, if you're not connecting to certain people, you're losing that traffic, right? you're losing that following. So it's so about just staying active and understanding how to use these social media. So why are you here, right? Why are we here with the conversation? Shock value. Mm -hmm. Is that a, um, a, is that a, does that give you an advantage in the social media game is, like framing things for shock value? Like what does shock value do to engage people, to get people to, is that important? Do you need shock value? The thing about the internet is it's just about what you're trying to do with your content, what you're trying to represent. I think that in 2005, 2004, uh, the big advertising companies wasn't advertising.
advertising on the squirrel in the park. It wasn't advertising on two cats fighting. Mm -hmm. But now the advertisers see uh, the relevancy of just throwing their ads on any video. So it could be a fight that accumulated a million views and Verizon will put their ad on that video and, wow. and, and people are partnering. So it depends what you're trying to do. You, know, you don't want to be running for president and, and doing shock body. So if you got a brand and, and you're consistent, you can weed out what you're doing with your content. A lot of people look at certain sites and see what they do and, and you know get turned off because you can log on to these sites and see people getting uh, brutally mm -hmm. uh, attacked and whatever the case. But some sites understand we have to bring in these numbers so we can give uh, the people what we also want to give them as well. Wow. Okay. All right. All right. BG, um, what are the, some of the most efficient platforms for up-and-coming artists? Well, I mean, as a as a as a as an up and coming artist in the urban market, really, what you want to be able to do is you want to take your brand and put it to the street. A lot of these artists nowadays think that basically it's just going to happen mm -hmm. by doing just one or the other. Right. You have to coalesce both. Mm -hmm. You know, so although I personally don't like the content on a world star hip hop, mm -hmm. I would still never tell an artist don't use world star hip hop. The means of how you get there, in other words, if you're paying extreme amounts of money you're not really going to get the views that might be portrayed. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is use several platforms. And like the brother said here about Facebook, knowing how these social markets are actually compartmentalized is very key. Mm -hmm. It's 100% right. If you're not acting when you're following on Facebook, mm -hmm. that part, that portion no longer sees you. Mm -hmm. See, that's why Twitter is really, you know, let, let's look, let's really explain that because you know, there was a time when you had, say, maybe you 5,000 followers. Mm -hmm. Your 5,000 followers on Facebook, your 5,000 friends could engage with you at any time. Mm -hmm. They saw your post in the street. But now Facebook has done something that kind of filters out what you see from your friends. Right, because what happens is all the ads you see on Facebook are driven by Facebook. They're the bully on the block. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you remember when you signed up, everything you see on the ad roll is stuff that you actually like. Mm -hmm. That's driven right through you. Mm -hmm. So on the same on the same vision of that, the other people that might not be into what you like mm -hmm. as our i.e. our posts, mm -hmm. they won't see that. Got you. you. see? Whereas Twitter is a direct line. Right. You know, if you have a true following on Twitter with one tweet, and, you know, a guy like Rick Ross, mm -hmm. I mean I've seen a thousand, fifteen hundred hits in the first twenty minutes mm -hmm. with, with a major powerhouse Twitter account. Mm -hmm. You know? So that gets into the whole conversation of organic as well. Because you really want to build that organic following. Right. Well, just, explain that word organic and how it relates to this conversation. Well, how it relates to the conversation really is there's a lot of stuff out there where people are buying followers, you know, all types of crap's going on. And at the end of the day, these big companies, they're done with it. You know, Twitter's an IPO trade stock. Mm -hmm. You know, when all of a sudden you see someone who had 5 million followers and the next day they got like, you know, 1.5. They're going to say, you know, plausible deniability, oh, I didn't buy it. Mm -hmm. Someone in the crew did, right? But the bottom line is, is that that's not real. It's not reality. Right, that's you know, whereas you look at someone who's come up from the very beginning, organic, organic, mm -hmm. and they built that themselves, they're interacting with, with their fan base. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget hip hop. Mm -hmm. The artists are the fans. Mm -hmm. And vice versa. That's right. You know, I'm a fan of Hakeem before I was even gotten into being a rapper. Mm -hmm. You know, so that has a lot to do with it. And it's one of the funny things about this type of music. You know, when you look at rock and other genres, it's it's, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. You know, most of the time those bands they just fail. You know, once they fail at a venue, they're done. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this art, you can you can grow. Mm -hmm. You know, you just might have to find your right lane um, to be successful in hip hop. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Rob, how how we how we doing in this sound? We good? Yeah. Yes, yeah, we're decent. We're good, we're good, we're good. We're good. So Not optimized like we need to be, but... It's all good. Say that is an organic show, ladies and gentlemen. We're growing from the ground up. So, you know, if it's looking a little rough, rugged, and raw, understand that we're here in North New Jersey, the Bricks, at a youth center for real, for real. We're doing this for real, for real. My team, my crew, this is guerrilla style. We're just making it happen. So just come along with, for the ride for us. Dash. Uh... What's a blogger? Like, you know, that word well, blogger, I'm about the blog or vlog, video log. What is a blogger and how important are bloggers to the entertainment industry today? Good question and bad question at the same time. The thing about the internet, man, the internet is so expressive, the internet is so free. 
that titles, crafts, skills get thrown around loosely. If you look at if you look at TV and TV format, they're doing everything on TV that they said they couldn't do a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Being in transitions, the way they present the shows, mm -hmm. they basically copied off all the young kids that was coming up and just doing all kind of wrong things with the camera. Mm -hmm. But that created formats, that created styles, that created genres. The blogger, to me, is, you know, you're getting that raw content from different personalities, different perspectives. You're giving them that content from, from the perspective that you see. But like I said, I can be completely honest when it comes to uh, creating a website. I learned how to make websites because I was shooting videos and everybody wanted to be on websites. I learned how to shoot videos because I used to make beats and when I seen video <coughs> software, it was similar to making beats. So I didn't go to school for, for videography. I learned how to do it. You know, organic. Well, yeah, yeah I, I put it out there, put it to the world, the world accepted it. So blog and different people's concepts and different people's perspectives, you might get different answers. Mm -hmm. It's basically giving people that unfiltered news. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you see news or when you see somebody's story in a movie or you see somebody's story from different people's interpretations, you're like, that's not how it happened, that's not this. You know, so I'm giving people news when people can relate to it and how they can relate to it. I remember, I would say, when, um, what's the boy's name from Atlanta, uh, DJ, um, we had a mixtape. DJ Fez ran up in the spot. Um, Cannon? Hmm? Cannon? Nah, uh, the one who works with him. Beard. The DJ, uh, DJ from Atlanta. Who was Drama? Drama. Drama. Yeah. DJ Drama. Big shout out to Drama. You know you're homie. Just got your name real quick. You know how we all do a Spark Magazine. Anyway, um, you know, like when Drama was really popping off and, and Lil Wayne had released a series of mixtapes, like the mixtape was the way to get on. Everybody, oh, you gotta do a mixtape, you gotta do a mixtape, you gotta get a deep, this DJ for your mixtape, right? And then it's like about a year, year and a half went by, and everything was about the blogger. And it wasn't about the mixtape DJ, it was about getting real content to the blogger and having bloggers write. That, that blew my mind, you know. So if you could just quickly like name some of the hot bloggers out there, whether you two dope boys or you know, I, I guess uh, 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 Elliot Wilson will be another one, or Vlad TV. What's some other, you know, young or more established bloggers out there, and how they function? Like I said, man, I'm, I'm in the world of doing what I do. Mm -hmm. I say, I definitely respect, I love Vlad. I would say popular websites. Because as you know me, you know, I'm into so many different world in so many different arenas mm -hmm. that every popular blog, I definitely know two dope boys now, right? Exclusive zone, you know, some of the popular websites. But you know, I'm into so many different facets and so many different things. You know, I, I started rapping, you know, I just grabbed the camera. So can I say I'm a cameraman? I, I haven't went to school, learned to craft. I don't really put myself with the cameraman or blogger. I do everything. So when it comes to community, you know, I really go to, to prison, you know, so I, I do call me a political activist, but, you know, I do everything. I don't really put limitations, or I can't really say I know the blog. I, I see the worlds, I know the worlds. My mind moves so quick in so many different ways. It's just that, like, it, 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 it really messed my head up, right? It still does to do a show, mm -hmm. right? And everybody in the audience yeah. got a camera or a microphone like this. Yeah. So it's not. You're not really performing for the, the live audience. Mm -hmm. You're performing for the audience that these people represent. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's strange to me. Maybe, you know, being star for hip hop. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the art and craft of blogging and creating content, it's just like, how's your kids, how's your wife? You can't go to school and know that will work. Mm -hmm. You can't, and that's the thing about the internet. The internet is that innocent ignorance. Meaning, when we put this up, nobody is the expert and know, and I don't know if y'all know Charlie bit me, like, these powerful YouTube posts. You can't go to school to craft that art and to know that will be that. You know, so this is the free world of unwritten rules. People grab these cameras, people grab the mics, people mm -hmm. grab these, these, uh, these YouTube pages, and they don't have no skills, no craft. But they're the best in what they do. You know, school well. reason, mm -hmm. and all of these young kids that just grab these cameras, and the next day they're on TV, they in movies. I always say, if you want, if you if you make something and I follow your rules, I'm gonna never really be better than you, because I'm right under you with your rules. Mm -hmm. The man that break the rules and create his own format, his own style, that is the future 
Nina Iverson crossover used to be a character. Mm -hmm. And he started doing it, right. and now that's a move. And now right. people copy off him. You, you want to add on? Yeah, I mean, I call it string theory, basically. You know, if you look at like how the Arab, Arab Spring went down, mm -hmm. you know, all these overthrows and, and change in the Middle East, everybody was their own newscaster. You know what I mean? That's very similar to the type of shows. I mean, we did a gunplay show at, at SOBs about six months ago, and it was exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, so the end of the day is really like this internet now is like right there. They're, they want it now, and they want to put it out to the following that's there mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and he touched on the, on the blogger itself. It, it, it's funny because I would, I would beckon to ask to Elliot Wilson, did he know where he would be 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. I would like to know that. Same thing with Q. You know, we've talked about this before. You know, Q, that site went through the roof because you couldn't find videos that we liked anymore on TV. Mm -hmm. That whole advertisement wheel just disappeared overnight. Right. So it was there at a prime occasion in time. Mm -hmm. And that's why that happened. Now, like right now, a lot of people look at my site as a blogging site. I just now started through Hannah. Mm -hmm. We just started putting out articles because it's relevant. Mm -hmm. And I find that with the articles, there's more keyword to be had to do. Okay. You see all the time. Um, and I like how you orchestrated and articulated mm -hmm. about being your own businessman and developing your own idea. Because mm -hmm. I find myself, I have a, a track list I just put in here today. It's Giant Killer, which is Joel Ortiz. It's a, a verse he gave me. I just got a Crooked Eye verse for a track called Perfect Day with a legendary cocaine. Shout out to cocaine. Mm -hmm. And I find myself only listening to my music I'm going to put out. Mm -hmm. I don't really so much care about drill music and trap beats. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, my push is going to be what I'm pushing. So you got to know how to play Chinese Go rather than checkers also. Wow. You see, I want to occupy so many pieces of that board that it's like almost terroristic, really. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't care because I'm eating enough from the inside. Wow. Well, not, because we had some discussions about, I guess, how, how you intend on diversifying Star Force. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to drop any you know, jewels that you don't mean to, mm -hmm. but if you just share with our audience some of the techniques that you're using to diversify Star Force so you don't get pigeonholed in one lane? Yeah, absolutely. You know, first of all, we cover the culture first of hip hop. So Star Force is the trademark and brand, but I just partnered with Rohan Marley and StarForceJamaica.com, which of course that path I was led down from the success of Star Force Hip Hop. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he invited me to his house downtown in, in Manhattan. And I was just blown away, Floyd, mm -hmm. you know, by that habit. And almost everyone that I'm growing with within the hip hop culture is leading me to other aspects. Like, for instance, I have Star Force Global, mm -hmm. I have Star Force Asia, mm -hmm. Star Force India. Mm -hmm. For me to cut off, and it's not just hip hop, I'm talking about culture. Mm -hmm. You know, because for me to ostracize anything else, we wouldn't be here today without the success of culture. Yeah, period, especially pertaining to hip-hop, mm -hmm. you know? The thing is, once I saw that the hip-hop site was a success, I knew that the lane was open for everything else. Because mm -hmm. that was most likely to fail. So, you got, like, Star Force is your brand. Correct. And you have Star Force Hip-Hop, you're doing Star Force India. Exactly. So you're taking your brand exactly. and you're diversifying it. Exactly. So you're not pigeonholed in one lane. Exactly. But knowing, knowing, knowing the limitation to that is key. Mm -hmm. You never want to over-brand it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would... Like Establish yourself. Exactly, like I had Star Force Euro as well. Mm -hmm. But I would never do Star Force UK, just that. Mm -hmm. Because first then you got you have to bring into what's gonna happen with Ireland and, 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 and Britain's, you know, yeah. that is an issue. Yeah. When you when you put it as continental, you're bringing everybody to to, mm -hmm. to the dinner table. Right. Yeah, and I, it's, the reason why I think that's so important for the viewership out there, folks who are on social media looking to use this as a platform for yourself, is that you know, you are a brand, you are content, Absolutely. so to speak. So just as you can be successful on your block, you need to think of ways of thinking outside of the block so you can diversify yourself. Still maintain your authenticity, you don't want to sell yourself out, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be exclusively to one place because your life, your shelf life will be that much limited. Limited, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, Dash, and uh, you know, Twitter, you have Twitter, very popular platform, everybody's on it, right? Okay. Then you have this thing called Black Twitter. What exactly is Black Twitter? I don't know what that is. I heard about it, I've never, I 
Oh, but there, there is a platform called Black Twitter, or is it just what black people are doing on Twitter? Uh, I heard about it. I'm not sure. I haven't researched if they did anything. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know a little bit, but nothing to speak, you know, like, like I have a PhD on it. Mm -hmm. But from what I've heard, was, it was pertaining to quotes and, and, and certain feelings that can be put out there, just point blank and black and white, pertaining to the culture. Right. So I thought it was, you know, from what I understand, black people have a tremendous amount of influence on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And um, we see black people seem to be driving a lot of the hashtags, a lot of the themes mm -hmm. in, into it. So there's this concept like you have black Twitter where you have to, you know, I get not appeal to what black people on Twitter are thinking, but there is that circle of conversation that is driven by black folks that influences so many other things outside of the black community. I wouldn't know I'm, at, I'm, I'm, I'm asking. I don't know. Uh, one thing with that, with, with all of these social networks, and maybe this is on topic and maybe this is not, you know, one thing uh, a lot of people need to know, uh, a lot of the content you put on these social networks that, it, that isn't copyrighted, but everything you put is owned by the Library of Congress. Everything you do, all, all your tweets, your data, is owned by the, all of your public information. It's owned by the Library of Congress. And to me, that's where the new revenue When mm -hmm. you say own it, you mean they just catalog it? Or yeah, they, they, they own it, they control it. Catalog. They own the catalog. And then you have to look at, you have to look at, you see how we don't use MySpace, you know, right? Right, right? But all of that information and data from MySpace is still owned by MySpace. So imagine if Michael Jackson had a MySpace account. How much would his messages and tweets be worth? Mm -hmm. And can they print a book out on that? So these are things you need to look at, even if, even if you have these companies creating these, these data collecting domains, whereas Facebook's and, and their pictures are on there. I know somebody that had a, a family member that passed away, and then Facebook locked that account. And they had to go contact Facebook for their own family members' mm -hmm. pictures, and you know, so you got to think about these companies, and what is this? What is this data? What am I really saying? You know, and I got people, you got people that look, and they go look two years ago, and they had different thoughts, a different lifestyle, different mind. You know, but that's just like a book. If Twitter owned your book, you know, so it's like just understanding these these, these social networks and these social media. Now that you about to like say that, I kind of want to circle back around to another point that was raised about advertising, mm -hmm. right? And you know, there's so much money being generated on these social network platforms, mm -hmm. social media platforms, that you know. We're making the users are making it drive, making it go. Free employees. Uh, uh, exactly. Unplaying, but we're working <laughs> for Facebook. We're working for Twitter. And then are they not doing nothing? You're free employees. Right. Free employees, but is Facebook and Twitter working for you? You, you have to make it work if you use it right. Yeah. yeah. Because a lot of people, like a lot of young people, a lot of artists, they get on these social networks and they get consumed by the social network. Right. right. Mark Zuckerberg, and maybe their first idea was to just connect with college people, but the idea is so big and so powerful, you got to know nobody actually care about you having a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand advertising, you have to understand impressions, you have to understand Google Ads. So I had one part of that, one, one guy that was looking up uh, vans, he went to buy a van. Mm -hmm. Every site he went to, vans start popping up. So I had to teach him, uh, once you, or any Google brand site, those ads are gonna follow you because it's all in the search engine of what you search. When they say suggested friends, those are friends that conversate in the same mm -hmm. conversation you have. Mm -hmm. So they're basically collecting the data, and the day you log on, the data is being logged and saved. Right. That's actually, I and mean, that's very, very scary in the sense that, you know, it's, you have uh, really computers, you have someone putting you in a box, and then boxing you off even more by only exposing you to things that they think that you like. Mm -hmm. and Think you be into it, your world becomes very controlled at that point. So you know, my space, when you get on my space or Facebook, and say you have 200,000 people in your network. That network of people that relate to your conversations, your location, and those are people that what you put out represent what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so it's the same thing, a lot of people don't understand Jay Z Samsung here, and what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. How you look at the Instagram and the Facebooks, and they're basically giving your data, you want your data. They can, they can check your phone conversations, they can, they can check your tweets, and they can check your information. Go, to, go look at what these 
uh, apps have permission to do on your phone. It's basically collecting data. Now they know what to sell you. They know where you at. They know what you do, what you like. And that's what that Samsung deal was with Jay-Z. Jay-Z gave them customers' thoughts and their minds. So now you got Samsung. They know what a million people like. So now they know what they can sell you and know what they can advertise to you. Now I'm going to throw the conversation over to you with this next question. Um, you know, because we know there are these social media platforms Right. And as a consumer, we engage with them easily, mm -hmm. right? But then you have things that, you know, people who are code writers, code, right? What is a code writer and how is that important to social media? Well, I mean, that gets into the design aspect, whether your website is PHP, um, you know, when you get into code writing, that's what actually gives you the final look of what a site looks like, which is, Algorithms, algorithms and codes that actually make up mm -hmm. that design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically the meta tags on the website, which kind of taps into the conversation just a minute ago, that has everything to do with data mm -hmm. You know, when you allow certain applications or you go to a website, they're using for retargeting. Mm -hmm. So basically what you visited and the coding files that are tracking on your own computer mm -hmm. actually dictate the type of ads that show up. And so, with my site, we use a certain meta tag to drive traffic to the search title. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if it's hot and green featuring so and so, and then the song, mm -hmm. you'll look at a lot of these artists like put an X or a hyphen, and song name first. All that screws up the coding on our website for the title. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the code writing itself, you know, this huge career is it because code keeps going. Mm -hmm. And you know you can only learn but so much yourself. So, the reason why I asked that question, you know, you know, what's a code writer and why is it important? Um, you know, with the, with these different applications that are being created, right? Um, and you know, folks in the hood culturally, we create a lot of the culture that's being used in these applications, right? But the folks in the hood are receiving the benefit for their influence. In this in this world, mm -hmm. right? So writing code or being, being familiar with the mathematics and how to create your own application, I think, will go a long way in helping the hood um, control a lot more of its cultural influence. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I wanted to, to kind of get the audience to understand the importance of code writing, especially for young folks who are all into the social media world. Everybody's on it. We're all using it, everybody has a phone, we're all using it. We should be creating the applications that go into these phones so we can dictate culture and how the rest of the world engages with our culture. You want to add on to that? that? The thing about that, um, the thing about the internet, you don't have that. You don't have to guess. Because Google and these, these websites are full of information. Mm -hmm. So the outside code of the website and the data you have to guess, but when I wanted to learn certain things about the camera, that's what I did. That's what taught me everything that, that I know pretty much. So it is, it's about, you got to understand industry. Even though it may seem like the internet is, is the wild, wild west, it's still people profiting off everything and everything that's going on. You look at the internet, you say, in the music business couldn't sell a record anymore. Because now you could just log on, hear your favorite song, download your favorite song. And now you look at um. I, I, uh, I forgot to do his name. He the first guy that was the first uh, foul sharer that came to his house, I uh, give you uh, a drug kingpin. Because he was tapping into an early industry that they haven't learned how to monetize yet. Mm -hmm. so what is this guy name? I think it was Ron Wire. Ron Wire. He looked yeah. at how they came in his house with helicopters because that was a billion dollar industry. Also. Billion dollar industry. Kaza also. Kaza was Okay, yeah, Kaza was another, another foul sharer. Yeah. You know, the thing about this, the thing about it is, is like, it's just a drop in the bucket to where the internet's going. These cable companies are in for a big, big chip store and bought more trucks. Now, you can get in, they did, they did, they did, like right now, Time Warner Cable just got bought by Comcast. Comcast. Now, there's a monopoly there, so you, without a doubt. But you see, the thing is, is like, think about it. What do you watch on TV? I watch certain news channels, and even the ones I might not lean towards just to see what their opinion is. Mm -hmm. right? I might watch HBO, I might watch a Showtime clip, mm -hmm. 
but I definitely will go get a movie from Netflix or even from uh, from Amazon uh, Prime. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can go and see. You don't have the time to sit there and just watch whatever you want to do. It's funny too because the star, the homie star in Buck Wild, I remember hearing the show. He had eight televisions in his room and was literally watching all the different opinions that are coming because nothing is being forced at the media. That's mm -hmm. part of the problem. Not to go off subject for some of these shootings that happened. They did happen. That did happen. It's just that the reporting on quick is actually when you look at violence and crime now compared to the 80s, mm -hmm. it's a lot lower now. Absolutely. It's just the attention is more that the coverage is more. Absolutely. If you look at a city like Chicago, the, the drill music town, right? Their, their murder rates through the roof. Mm -hmm. That's mismanagement. The reference Anthony Bourdain show uh, Parts Unknown on CNN. He just covered Detroit three weeks ago. You're, you're in a shopping mall here, and right next to you, 10 feet away, is overgrown trees and bushes from a business that was there. The population, 700,000, 10 years ago, it was in the millions. Mm -hmm. This is what's happening to the city as manufacturing jobs go. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine what's still happening in neighborhoods that where there's a lot of high crime rate anyway? Mm -hmm. High crime rates are never going anywhere. You know what I mean? It might get better now, depending on what city you're in, but that's a mismanagement. So yeah, but you can, I guess you can isolate it. You can isolate it and hold crime in one area uh -huh. through mismanagement. Or, or maybe it is management, appearing to be mismanagement, but you hold crime in a certain area so you can create safe haven mm -hmm. in other places. You know, the other hand, the internet gives us a very bright future to people that do want to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You know, I would never, I never dreamed that this is what I would have. You know, right now, this place is, if you, if you Google my site, some places rank it, you know, uh, worth, you know, four or five million dollars. Mm -hmm. At the lowest, that seems like 300,000. I did two and a quarter through PayPal last year. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, I know that I'm going to keep growing. One more time, what's your site? Starforcehiphop.com. Starforcehiphop.com. And if anybody who wants to call in, hit us at 862-588. 5729. Once again, hit us at 862-588-5729. Don't forget to say that. Um, yeah, so not to cut you off, but yeah, give me an example. I mean, if you look look at Maybach music, right? Every album's gold. Mm -hmm. But is that the new platinum? People are willing to accept that. So the perception of the Bel Air Rose, the Maybachs, the Ghosts, mm -hmm. all that is what they want you to see. Now, when you look at the form you're doing as far as format, mm -hmm. the business model usually stays the same to success, you know? But how you go about what your art is and what that what your business is, the point of sale. You know, you could be an artist for 15 years before. I mean, learning the business as you go mm -hmm. and then exploiting the factors that you have and your strengths. Mm -hmm. That's how I best describe it, you know? Okay. So I know both of you cats are, are pretty particular in, in what you see to post. Mm -hmm. Process do you use when deciding what content to post on your site? Uh, the same thing you said. As you as you uh, as you learn and grow, for me, it, it was just a different world, mm -hmm. and then it's different from watching the reaction to the world mm -hmm. and watching how the world reacted to it. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you one funny thing. You know that, that me and my, uh, my partner in St. Louis did. You know, after just uploading multiple different. Uh, uh, Graphics, video graphics. So you've got multiple different things as you grow and, and your career and your mind and your thoughts grow. So uh, shooting videos and shooting content, you know, when the content come in and videos come in and, and the negativity come in, now sometimes the content you represent and put out is your brand. Now a lot of times that is your, your customer base. You know, so if you talk about shooting this, shooting that, now that's your customer base. So about who you want to reach. You basically to answer the question and tell you what I was saying before. And everybody got to excuse me, y'all know I don't really do the camera thing that I do this. So I'm going to put my brother hot. Yeah, and I, and I really appreciate it because I think I'm the first yeah. in the history of Dash Dunk to get this yeah. brother on the, on the other side of the camera. And I, I interviewed a lot of people all around the world, man. So now that I'm there, we just gather my thoughts because I, I try to stay in the ground mode and not go way out there. But, you know, um, Look, my, 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 my people in St. Louis, I was like, man, I, I'm, I'm going to take a roach. I'm going to take a roach and just put a roach. It's like the popular things you look on the internet, you like, how does it work? This is stupid right here. And you just don't get how this got 10 million views. And so he did it before me. And we think it's funny. 
But the comics was just like, yo, that roach is fast. Yo, that roach is big. They didn't find it funny or stupid. But then when you think about the world, you think about people all around the world, people don't got a roach like that. They don't got a roach in that country. They don't got a roach that small. So it is channels on nature that look at lions and tigers. So when you open your mind up, when you open your mind up, and just think about content and what content looks like to other people. That's what made me change. So it was just like, when I was, when I was going in the hood, shoot, shoot, you got a hood uh, video. Now I gotta edit that. Now I gotta feel that. Now I gotta feel, I gotta get that perfect scene when you talk about shooting this kid in the head and blowing his head up. Now I become that. Now I got a son. And daddy, what you doing? Look, I'm editing this video with somebody shooting in the eye. Now my son is that energy. I'm that energy. The kid on the other end of that computer is that energy. The comments is killing the shooter, but we shot him the wrong way. <laughs> so I just got tired of editing this. I got tired of my son looking at this. I got tired of the, the feedback. Walking around, yo, my nigga, yo, the way you did the video, when you shot him in the head and his eyes blew up. It's like, can I offer anything else better? And I looked at every website. Damn, all we do is rap. All we do is play basketball. All we do is sell drugs. What else do we do? You know what I mean? And then I looked at TV, man. I ain't watching TV. They don't show nothing for us. They don't show us in a positive light. And then I looked at my brand like, I don't show us in a positive mm -hmm. light. You know, so that was the big picture. It was like, what am I doing? Where are we going? Where am I going? Yeah. See, I think like, just know the short time I've known you, like maybe four or five years now, right? I, I think that you've shown me so much, but from a space that five years ago, I would look at it as yeah. like, oh, that's, that, that's that lady shit, mm -hmm. right? That's that lady shit. But, and not nigga in a negative way, mm -hmm. mind you, but you already know what I'm telling you. We don't do that later. Anyway, you show me that it's intelligence, intelligence and ignorance. Mm -hmm. There's a way that we can approach something intelligently that will seemingly be ignorant to the average person but there's intelligence in it. And, um, you know, and that's going to lead us into the next conversation that's ridiculous. I just think that that's so important when you're dealing with, you know, the 85. You know, God and Earth know what I'm talking about. 85, why death is done. The majority of the people out there deal with the lowest common denominator, right? But we can't discount that. We can't just go, oh, that's that ignorant thing. Because you have to embrace that. That's where the majority of the people are. And even in doing so, you have to frame it in a way that reaches them. Like you said, um, you, know, you show a roach, and there are people who look at that. Man, that's a fast roach. That's a big roach. You don't have roaches like that. Man, look at it. Like, there's an intelligence behind it where if you just hit it, you're like, oh, I ain't paying no attention. So there's like a, a really it's a way to capture that in the two series of examples. We did a video on Puffy in the bathroom, right? And now he surprised me because you know, he came in and he said, you know, this is how it's about music and music. How can you phrase it? And the way you frame the video is actually the reverse of what I'm actually talking about. That video is up like 40,000 hits on a, comp a six minute conversation. <laughs> intellectual, intellectual solid information that if we can put in the title, I can uh, articulate the music vision. That don't, that don't resonate. So when you understand, so I always say if you want to talk to the world, say something dumb. Mm. You know, that, that's, that's what the world resonates with. The world, the world resonates with that ignorance. Ignorance is freedom. Ignorance, being dumb don't mean you, you, you're dumb. You know, it's just like if, if, you, if you close your eyes, if, if you close your eyes, if you close your eyes and can't see, you just don't see what's around you. You know, now that you open your eyes, there's a difference between being stupid and dumb. You dumb if you never have the opportunity to learn. Now the information is there. If you choose to stay that way, you're stupid. So being dumb, you can learn with different information once you, you open your eyes up to that information. You learn that information. I would say, if, if you got a message and it don't reach the people that need it, you don't have a message. Mm -hmm. So it's just about, Putting that title in a way because ignorance is a language. You know, so you can come through with your PhD, you can come through with your degrees, and you can use all the big words in the world you want. But if you're not reaching people that don't understand or don't know what you're talking about, 
you basically spoke Spanish to a people that didn't understand what you were saying. So it's about framing that title, framing that tag, and keeping it hip hop, keeping it cool. Because if you look at our history, our history is an old content that the youth can't get. If you look at videos from the 80s, the transitions are real slow. It's probably 200 transitions in videos from, from the early 80s. It's moving like that. Now videos move so fast because they got to show the liquor, they got to show the car, they got to show the girl, they got to show the subliminal message. It moves so fast that the mind got to move as fast as that. So when you look at Dr. Ben, if you look up all of our, our, our ancient, just older information, it's just an older form. So if you look at the Willie Lynch letter, what I did with the Willie Lynch letter, I took drawing, just somebody drawing a picture because even the kindergarten can relate to drawing. So, and I put that out and wrote somebody reading the Willie Lynch letter and, and a picture over it. You know, I think I got like a million views on World Star. So many different other people uploaded it. So it's probably like five million views. But that really reintroduced the Willie Lynch letter to the world. So it's about, that's what we need to do with information, with content, to just open minds. Because the world is just one brain. You got like 10 people in the world that think everybody else is just robots. And they just move without thinking. So you can make you can make water and sell people water. You can make fake you can make fake eyelashes and sell make people rip fake eyelashes off and put these fake eyelashes on. And our next conversation is about Nicki Minaj, so that's actually perfect. But before we get there, we got a call around? Yes, sir. Got Kurt Nice calling. Kurt Nice! The gods, the god, typical hip hop movement going on here, y'all. Shades of hip hop. What's up, Kurt? They're calling back. Man, Low hey man, we, it's organic, y'all. <laughs> Bear with us, y'all. What up, Kurt? What's going on? What's going on? Yeah, man, say that. Uh, Shout out to everybody here, man. Yeah, man. Salute. So what you got to say to our audience, man? Say that. Typically, world star right now is like uh, 250 uh, 
in the world, mm -hmm. and somewhere around 700 or 800 in the States, just to give you a stack of that. So anyway, that being said, the artists themselves should be looking to make themselves Alexa certified. Get your social network popping to the point where it's relevant. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you put the footwork and the groundwork into the internet and you make that one movement mm -hmm. and coalesce that, you're going to be much more successful. But like my personal opinion is treat each single like the actor. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to do like Beyonce. That's not what, it's just not going to happen. But, right, right. You know, but because of who she was, mm -hmm. people knew that that was happening. Mm -hmm. But they dropped it. Down mm -hmm. But because they had a fan base to pay with. Right. Mm -hmm. See? If you don't have that fan base, it's not going to happen. Right. About a week later, the locks was on Hot 97 when he broke, talking about exactly everyone had the same idea. Like, I had the same call from Mike left a year ago. Mm -hmm. You know, at Daddy's house. The exact, every, because people know conceptually what is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. It's obvious. You want to see the visual, you know? Now, the thing is, the quality of the visual, and how do you control it? Mm -hmm. You know, this is the problem with getting this, is what I tell everyone. Fuck the exclusive. I don't want the exclusive. You know what I mean? I want the artist to release his, on his release date. If it's hot, it should be grabbed by the other side, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it shouldn't be this whole pay to play. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't make money. Mm -hmm. But I found other ways to make money than having each artist for a post. Mm -hmm. I have the luxury if I don't want to charge that young cat and I see the success in what they're doing, mm -hmm. I'm going to get behind it. You know? Yeah. So really everything you do should be each single is its own album. You control the release date on the visual, whether it be Vivo, and that's a whole other skin. There's companies out there selling Vivo accounts because Vivo pays eight thousand from the A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. Record labels want to control that money. So there's artists out there that have gotten that haven't gotten the percentage that's probably supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And you want the labels have. So as this whole 360 thing evolutionizes, it gets more crazy. There's less money in the pot to make. Obviously, the independent way is where you go. So controlling the content and the music is everything. Right. So if you handle every single, like the album, mm -hmm. and I would do it by core every 90 days. Maybe a mixtape, yeah, you give that shit away. Fuck these websites, put it out there in a hard copy, get out 5,000. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're doing a show at Ridge in Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, with Joe Ortiz, and a bunch of my own artists mm -hmm. that are up and coming. They need to do a showcase. Joel is going to get paid for his performance. And everybody needs. Mm -hmm. We're going to hand out this case. Brandy. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is like, Star Force is not away, don't get me wrong. But I'm going to get behind where I see it pushing themselves in the middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. So each single is its own release. You control the iTunes, so you control the release date. And if the music's hot, not or more. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Well, Macklemore also had, uh, I hear he had a private investor who mm -hmm. put up you know, a game of money and they were able to strategically put money at radio as sort of thing. Absolutely. So, because, sure. so yeah, yeah, because if you can't compete, see this is the thing that people don't realize. The artists that sign a deal, mm -hmm. say Universal or maybe, what people mm -hmm. don't realize is 100 uh, labels under Universal, yeah, yeah. Is, you know? So that music right there, those artists, if the music's hot, they have budget paper to put it to. And that's why you hear these beats, all the hooks are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. You know, every song you might hear on 105 one, two seconds later it's on Hot 97, that's because they're their they eat buttons. Mm -hmm. So as an independent artist, you really are never going to make it to that level. But you don't have to. No, you don't have to. Absolutely not. Nah, you might just you don't have to. It's technology. Technology. Exactly. Yeah. You love me, uh, as you should. I'm going to touch on that point you made. Um, I think artists have to understand a lot of artists that if you submit your content to World Star, or you submit your content to a lot of these websites, a lot of them don't understand why they don't do posters. But the same thing he was saying, you are the label, you are the advertising. And I think you need to understand as individual equity, I always say every interaction is a transaction. You as an individual are, are that equity, you are that content. So it's just like if I got a main street, and I got a McDonald's, and I got a Best Buy, you might be hopeful, you might be better than McDonald's, you might be a better creativity, you might be better. But what traffic are you going to guarantee me to come on my main block, right. come on this block? So you're going to have to pay me the equity that I'm used to for this traffic, or you cannot be posted. So that's why a lot of artists get upset. Now you want to post me because I'm hot. Yeah, 
Because once you build your equity, once you build your traffic, once you got a fan base that's clicking on you, now you're going to bring traffic to my site. Yep. This is why you see websites with like Gucci and Mano, because they are, they are internal equity and they have internal value that they already built and accumulated their site. I, think, right. I really think you need to repeat that and break it down and get to pieces of folks. And what you just said is so on point and so important. Um, you know, oh, now you want to, now I'm hot, you know, like that's something that we hear all the time. And you just explain the reason. It's not because they, like, they caught the vapor, they're sweating now. It's not that they believe in the It's that every entity has value. And if I'm going to take down something that has value to replace it with something that has no value at this point, I'm going to lose out as a provider, you know, a content yeah. provider. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. A lot of artists say, I got potential, I'm hot, I'm going to be hot. Let me take your potential and give it to my landlord, give it to my son and put it in the bowl. Potential don't feed nobody. You can't send no video to the website and say, I got potential, can you look me out? So now, if you take that, that, that fellow, or you take that downfall, and you go do your show, and you go promote your mixtape, and you go put the work in, now those one, two, three, four, five fans, or a hundred fans, or two hundred fans, now you put a successful post up and you hit 500,000 people. Now you have another thing. It's a difference between a buzz and a follow. You know, first you get a buzz, they know you, but now you got one video at 500,000, now you try the next one and that got 10,000. So that following was out of the song or that content that you put out connected and they hit a certain website or a certain demographic of people and they connected. So you as, a, as an artist, you got to do so many different things if you don't have a person that's marketing and promoting you or a person that's check, checking the analytics on you. Because you got to look at yourself like you just said. You got to be the brand, label, the marketer, the promoter. You got to understand how to back in that your YouTube account work. And who found you? How did they find you? Did they find you from the Twitter link? Did they, did they find you from a, a Facebook? Did a popular website post you? You have to keep in contact with what made you get your buzz. Now, the buzz and the following, how many numbers do you have on Facebook? How many numbers do you have on Twitter? How many people follow you on your Instagram or follow you on your, your video? You know, it's buzz, buzz, following, and then consumers. So once you create that buzz and that following from your shows and that video, now these websites are more likely to post you because now you are a walking brand that brings traffic. Because that's how a website is paid. I post you, you hot, now you want me traffic. So now I got paid for my impressions and my clicks and comments and the traffic that you have me. That's the same way you pay Mark Zuckerberg every day. And you post it and you click it and you, you, we are refreshing the pages. We're free employees and we just don't know how we're making this company's money. But that is the big thing that you're an independent artist and you're coming up. You got to start doing things to blog, start doing things outside of your craft and just your music, start talking, doing interviews where you can become a brand that people just want to click on and follow you. So call the number 862-588-5729. 862-588-5729. Please call in. We still got a lot more time, a lot more conversation to get through. Um, you know, before we leave this particular conversation, um, I really feel the need to talk about World Star Hip Hop. Um, you know, World Star is a very controversial site. Um, a lot of people go to World Star for content, um, for the types of content that's up on World Star. Um, you know, very controversial, very risque. You know, is World Star positive or is World Star negative or is it neither? <laughs> to me, it was, I mean, look at that. Uh, think about World Star, what they do. Uh, think about content. Uh, Martin Luther King said, uh, content of the character. You know, if you look at a lot of content, and you look at a lot of things that are being presented around the world, you know, you, you're in the pocket of minds. You're, you're going into people's perspectives. You're going into people's lifestyles. You're going into people's environments. You're going into people's world. So me running up to somebody, knocking them out, I thought that was funny. You think that was insulting, that was negative. So we're diving into people's life. They're showing us the world in its rawest form. Yes, they're bringing attention to it. Yes, they're bringing the views. But Tupac said in one of his interviews when he said, 
I want to make the raw music ever to show them how hard it, how hard it is and, and the poverty level, so they want to change something. So if we see these environments where our youth are playing the knockout game, where people are knocking people out, where girls are getting raped, we're looking at America, we're looking at the, we just looking at the world and its sickness. So is it cute for, for posting it, or is it the environment? Is it the parents that's not raising children? Somebody's capturing this content and putting it up. So somebody knocks somebody out, cutting somebody, stabbing somebody, somebody beats somebody up for Jordan. Is it Jordan Park for not lowering the price? Is it cute for, for uploading the video from the Jordan? Or is it the family problem for not educating and raising their son that shot somebody for Jordan? You know, that's like I, I, I personally think that it's, it's, it's it, there is no one person yeah. to blame or one. It's, it, it's everybody's problem. It's everybody's responsibility. It's everybody. Everybody plays a part. Nike and Brand Jordan makes money off of people's misery. That wasn't their intent. Their intent was to make money. But we know that people are coming from conditions and situations where they're willing to do anything for a pair of Jordans. So does Jordan have a responsibility? I don't know. That's not up to me to say. But we know that people are, okay, so it's the school system. What do we do about the school system? How do we fix the school system? The parents say, well, it's the parents, but the parents were raised by the same conditions that are uh, producing the children. So how can the parents help when they need help themselves? Okay, well, it's the politicians. Well, the politicians, you know, if they don't get the support from the people, if they don't get the support from corporations, if they got, if it's all about the money, they have to play the money game, or they can't be a politician anymore. And so it's it's a it's a a cycle, it's a circle, everybody. Now you have this vehicle, World Star, that's basically, you know, everybody's walking around with shitty draws, and World Star's like, look, y'all, we got shitty draws on them. Look, y'all. Like, the thing about it, one thing about um, having an impressionless mind, meaning every thought that goes into your eyes leave a fingerprint on your mind. So it, it's leaving the impressions on the, the, uh, the blind youth. So me and you can watch content on World Star, and we can decipher this is this and this is that and this is why that happened. So to say something wrong in that scale because you have young impressionable minds that okay the knockout game was negative. The knockout game came from an environment that thought that was funny. But now the knockout game is becoming a brand. Now knocking somebody out screaming a website is becoming a brand. Now raping somebody taping it is becoming a brand. And then now if you post that now you are profiting on somebody's fight. You're profiting on somebody's death. You're profiting on somebody's struggle, pain. But that's deep in the world, so that's America. Absolutely. <laughs> America you know, profits my, of pain. My take on it, you know, and I have a pretty unique insight on this. I shot the footage of Ross during the 50s. I had a site called Who uh, uh, Who Needs 50. Mm -hmm. Right, which looked exactly like this. And I did it just to be a jerk, all well, funny, right? I had him with a candy cane, you know, uh, one of the, the swirly candy, you know, uh, lollipops in the dress. And he had this whole gimmick of curl. Mm -hmm. And Ross was calling him curly and monkey, you know. Mm -hmm. So, shout out Spiff TV, by the way. But I went there with, with uh, an 8 million. And boy, did I get laughed at afterwards, right? Because they were coming into the HD. You know, there was HD 8 millimeter, but they were coming into the digital mm -hmm. at this time. And I had just got done telling Ross about uh, about my personal dealings with the Gomez brothers, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, Nelson Tabota and Gabby Acevedo, right? And cut that story out, but as soon as the camera went on, my man clambered to the camera and I seen the star. I had met him that night, so I didn't know anything about Ross other than his music. As soon as that camera went on, it was like a movie set. And I mean, he, he, he went in. Mm -hmm. I gave that, that footage to, to the world star the next day. And man, they had like 600,000 hits, like overnight. Miss Mimi's calling me up because I was supposed to be on their show during my rap career. Oh, now you want to call me that? You know what? They wanted to have just the audio rip from the visual mm -hmm. and probably to do whatever gimmicks they were going to do, and I wouldn't do that. So they got me on the show, you know, and uh, I'm like, you know, deep in the rap and I'm being a jerk, you know. But at the end of the day, that footage went super viral mm -hmm. because of what it dealt with. Mm -hmm. that, that, that beef between the two, the dichotomy of that, you know, personally, 50 Cent definitely. He misjudged Ross as far as the quality of the music that he put out. Mm -hmm. Beyond, he thought he was on top, and that's what he does. He slays careers. And 50, that's what he did do. Mm -hmm. But that, Ross was in the time change where it was changing, mm -hmm. where if you could put quality music out, 
still relevant for all of you if you want to grow up. Yeah. The reason I bring that up is for a year before that, every video I tried to give of my artist and myself, of course, the Q was posted. This is when Q actually ran the site still. Mm -hmm. you know, now there's a whole slew of people that, that are running the website. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what's going to dictate the price of it. And that's what's going to dictate the content. So a lot of you can't really per se. It's, yeah, he has the final say. When, when I first caught when the world started, I was, I was late to the site. You know, when I first caught on, it was right about the time we did a hip hop community call to action. And we shot, we did a conference over at IYO. We shot out the building um, over at IYO. And then we had the new, we had uh, uh, Supernova Slam, Ross Baraka, and Walk Oil, Black Dot, and Dr. Von Pryor. And that event was positive. It was conscious. It was so you know we, we filmed it. You put some footage up. The Movement Magazine put some stuff up. And on YouTube, you know we did like you know you know six seven thousand. It was slow out the gate, but somebody put it up on World Star. We didn't pay for it. We didn't pay for that. Like I was surprised that they even took it because of the subject matter. But I think Supernova Slam and Young Guru, their performance. Just the numbers was on World Star was like hundreds of thousands. No, I, I sent it to them, but I spent it with that title because they they put yeah. are, are you a real blood or crit? They use that negative element to make that positive thing spin because that's what they care about. They right. care, they care awesome, about man. numbers, man. And that's also not to go off subject, but that's how one of the best ways to get artists to retweet you and follow with you. Like I had Birdman retweet. Me. I rephrased their title because they had put such a long title in all the meta tags were way too long. And national art too. That's yeah. Like, that's art how to, make, yeah. how to put this big topic yeah. in a couple words. Yeah, he had bought a cherry red roll, so I had specifically titled the book. But see, he'd be keeping us a secret from me for like, we're talking about four years. Like, I never knew how that content got up on World Star. He just uh, told me. But the jewel is, the real jewel is, the way you frame Tyler. Right, he tapped into the perception of the poster. Right. And that's the key to it, you know? Right. So, for all our super intellectuals, for all our conscious community folks, you know, World Star isn't necessarily a negative thing. We just have to be smarter in how we engage with it so we can get our messages out. Plus, you can only post with so much in the day, huh? Mm -hmm. And it's also another thing. One thing about World Star, about the things they post, they post life that we try to hide. Same thing, like, like for years I ain't never let my son play with toy guns, play gun games. <clears throat> and one thing I realized, the dialogue in that thing, right? So his mother seen him playing, um, what is it, Call of Duty. Oh, why you got that on, da 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 da, -da. So without that game, when are we gonna have this conversation? Let him play with that. And I got a whole conversation and dialogue that I'm gonna have with him right after that. So if we don't see these videos in this world that we don't know exists, we gonna keep running from these conversations because these conversations are from communities all around the world that's being segregated, and it's the same thing. Like imagine if we had Instagram doing slavery. So many different conversations and so many different images and so many so much different data and so much different hidden information will be exposed to the world. So it's like, what can we take from that? Is that wrong on this level? Is it wrong on this level? So these kids that are being abused, that are being deprived, that are, that are raping little girls, that are slapping little girls, that are shooting up uh, strip clubs, what is the conversation that needs to be had uh, about these locations in these urban environments? What is, what is the conversation? What is the conversation of, of, of everything we talk about, don't want to talk about, when we look at um, um, uh, Barack Obama, whole campaign, he took to the media, he took to the young demographic, he tapped into some of the people, you know, that, that nobody ever thought about. So that's the thing about the, the, the internet, and the thing about people that, that's on the internet, these conversations, this, this dialogue, the beauty of time. Look at Ice Cube, look at NWA, look at that data, look what they represent. Now look at them today. You know, so it, it, it's the time, and what is these stories telling? Mm -hmm. what, what is this picture? I always say, don't judge a picture every creator still can. Mm. You know? African proverb, don't measure frog until it's dead. Mm. We, we, don't, we, don't know, yeah. hey, we don't know what it is. We don't know what this finished piece is. We don't know what it's about. What story is it going to tell? So, so on that note, right, don't judge an artist until it's done painting. Mm. Right? 
we are still with this Nicki Minaj controversy with the, with the, the single looking ass niggas, um, the album cover, the single cover artwork. And she said it was unofficial. Um, the single is not a real single. Um, where she has the image of Malcolm X holding, you know, the joint at the window. It's a classic photo of him protecting his family, protecting his house, looking out of the window. Um, and then the song is her talking about all the things that she doesn't like. Um, all the things that she doesn't like. Looking at niggas who look at her but can't get her. Or people who look like they're window shopping but can't buy it. Or cats who are in VIP, you know, can't really afford the bottle, doing credit card scams, but, you know, um, associating that concept, that lifestyle, and putting the Malcolm X image to me. I don't know if it backfired on her. I don't know if it's been such a hot point that it helped the single take off and now she has more attention. You had even said in one of your posts that now there are, you know, a generation of young folks who don't know who Malcolm X is who are now aware of the Malcolm X and do more research. Um, what do we think about that? Like, what, what's the, you know, not, not asking you to take a stance either way, but, you know, what's the effect in the world for her putting that out there in the out? In those cases, the same thing. Um, a lot of people have so many different topics and so many different arguments they be saying, I don't know what she was saying on Twitter, but they were saying how could she compare herself to Malcolm X or something. And I was telling people, Malcolm X used to be red. Malcolm X had a journey. Malcolm X had a beginning. Nicki Minaj has a beginning. You look at Queen Latifah, you look at Arnold Schwarzenegger, you look at the beginnings, it, that, that has nothing to do with the end. And that's what I was saying, how she introduced Malcolm X to a whole new demographic of people. Meaning, I know kids that go to Malcolm X High School and they don't know who he is. So, whether they seen, whether they, whether they seen the image of him and they thought it was negative or, or, or a negative presentation, at the end of the day, it's, it's still creating conversation. It's still making his name move in the search engine. So now children that see Malcolm X, that, that see his, his logo, meaning his, his visual face, and some choose to do the research and find out his story. A lot of times it's not important how you found out about the content, as long as you find out about the message, as long as you find out what it represented. So um, I definitely think uh, if, if, if that was the case, let's say if she did want to present Malcolm X to a group of people or a group of rappers, she definitely could have did it better but in the art of telling the story, and just like we were just talking about how, to, how we title something, the art, of, the art of introducing something to a new group of people, mm -hmm. who knows, who knows uh, the different approach. But, but like you said, I know thousands and thousands of people know the name, know the name, whether they choose to look them up or not, thousands of people know the name. But then it's all in the context of how we want to hold the word name, you know? Yeah, that, I mean, we already know how, you know, we've done a number of clips when we discussing the word nigga and its true meaning, its true origin, like that whole thing. But then I also know that, you know, in modern parlance, you know, we can take the word nigga and, and use it to mean so many different things, mm -hmm. right? So when I hear her use the word nigga in that sense, I know she's not being positive with the word. She's not using the positive connotation that the origin of the word was intended, right? So. That and coupled with Malcolm X, for me personally, I hold that him as a person, as a leader, what he symbolized, Malcolm X, El Haj, you know, I mean, excuse me, El Haj, El Shabazz, Omar Wali, that person isn't Detroit Red. Mm -hmm. Isn't, you know, he's not the Harlem hustler. That part, that was a transformation that took place. Bro. It broke and we became another person, right? Yeah, we all have a whole life and we are all many things, but in terms of, you know, the last 50 years, 60 years, there's probably been no other person to make such a complete transformation. I mean, we, we're never complete, we're always evolving, we're always growing. I don't know, you know, he's not God, but he is the God, if you know what I mean. Um, Malcolm is just, something that if we're not going to deal with him in the right way, for me, my personal opinion, is better not to deal with him at all. Because so much 
can get lost, and we don't want to reduce him back down to Detroit Red. We don't want that to be the override. So when we have a Nicki Minaj, right, or any other artist out there who, like KRS-One, who did by any means necessary, right? And on the album cover, KRS-One mimicked that whole thing. And you can say, well, KRS-One did it, how come? It's because KRS-One at that point was representing knowledge, wisdom, understanding, activism, social consciousness, awareness. He was addressing a lot of the issues that Malcolm X, El Haj Malik, El Shabazz, Omar Wali, that person, KRS-One was reaching to that. Nicki Minaj seems to be relating more to the Detroit Red mentality. I get what you're saying on that because uh, if you look at uh, internet, internet, internet data and, and internet traffic, so now Nicki Minaj is so big she can almost I wouldn't say white, but she she can now become equity in his search engine now. Yeah, you know, so so just like. Uh, Puff Daddy and Diddy. And when Puff got into the situation with J-Lo, he changed his name to Diddy. He didn't want that in his search engine. The gun shooting, so he changed his name to Diddy. Now he created a whole new search engine for himself. So same thing with the Blue Ivory. That was a lady company. The Blue Ivory, I think she sold cookies or something. Beyonce named the daughter Blue Ivory, wiped the whole company. Blue Ivory wiped the whole company off the internet. Right. So that, that's definitely important. Well, speaking to that, alluding to that, um, I actually been through that as a rapper. I was BG the Prophet, mm -hmm. and you can still find, in fact, connected with Rick Ross's name because of that World Star post. I'm still embedded in the engines, mm -hmm. you know, collectively, whether it's Bing or Google. But as I've built up, you had to destroy to rebuild, so to speak, and that's what I've done with Star Force. Mm -hmm. So basically, now I'm Star Force BG or Star Force HH, which is Star Force Heavy Hitter mm -hmm. on the Twitter, and that you can actually see. The, you know, the transgression to where I am now mm -hmm. on the internet using that. But you gotta understand that picture, it's an iconic picture, number one. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were just, any one of us had just put that picture on Instagram and didn't put anything for a slogan or a hashtag, what would have been the comments and remarks back to it? You know, we could also say any publicity is great publicity. Because if in fact that was a plan, that was an indelible plan mm -hmm. to tie herself to an icon, mm -hmm. regardless of what her music is. Right, and like that, like her tying herself to an icon is crazy. That like last night I was listening to um, BLS and Gary Bird did a segment talking about a teacher in New York in Queens who had an uh, uh, had an uh, activity for Black History Month and was asking students to write about their favorite Black History person. So a couple of kids wanted to write their papers on Malcolm X. The teacher told them that they could not write about Malcolm X because he was negative. They could write about Martin Luther King, they could write about Frederick Douglass, they could write about, but they couldn't write about Malcolm X. So you have someone who's outside the culture now defining for young folks what their, who their hero should be and what their history should look like. Now, this teacher to say, Google Malcolm X and Nicki Minaj is tied to it, it's like, oh my God, no, you can't. If this is the, so we've got to be really careful about how we, how we present our icons. Now, I saw Nicki Minaj's apology, and I, you know, I personally feel it was a half-hearted, half-ass apology, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> But it's you know it's you know it's the same way with Lil Wayne with the disrespect of Emmett Till, um, you know you know me being an MC you know, I, I've said some I've got some bars in my catalog that's out there mm -hmm. that's like you know it's borderline you know disrespectful, but I censor myself all the time I edit myself all the time there's just certain things that I'm just not gonna say out of respect for people who I may be offending who I may be hurting or the lasting impression that it leaves. And I just think that we, will, we have to be careful that we just don't do anything for shock value because we have to leave something for the young people. Like, everything can't be about what can I get right now. It's not about the, the now moment. Well, the, the now moment when people say there is no past, there is no present, there's only now. But the now 
is finite or the now is infinite because every moment in time is the now. Mm -hmm. So we have to respect our ancestors in the now moment so that our future can respect us in the now moment, in their now moment. Um, so that's kind of like where I'm at with it. We're, we're, we're expecting another call-in guest, Rosa Clemente, who put up a, uh, a petition to change.org and garnered thousands of signatures in protest of this Nicki Minaj single looking ass nigga. So we're expecting her to call. I hope she calls in. But in the meantime, I just want to carry the conversation along. I think it's just that important that, you know, the artists that are out now, you know, how we say in hip hop, there used to be a code. Yeah. But, and there is no code now. Yeah, well, part of what I really feel is happening within the industry, especially at this success level that these people are having, is a narcissistic takeover. Mm -hmm. Where they're so in love with themselves, they feel like their plight, their battle, their, everything they took to get where they're at culminates to this point. Mm -hmm. We all know that feeling when you throw that three-point switch, when you run that 40, you know, 5 eight, 5 flat, whatever, you know, you know you do something that's an accomplishment. That feeling we all get when we're accomplished. Mm -hmm. Either you work hard at it or you had real talent. Mm -hmm. But once you get good at something through repetitiveness, you know it's almost a short bet. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these artists get to that point in their career where they literally feel that they are far enough to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And personally, you know, that type of photo and then associate a single to it. It's not a real single, we just got done talking about it. The best way to put out is right. to treat a single album, as an album. Yeah, right, 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 this right. is Nicki Minaj. Because without her platform of success, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be talking about it. Right now. Mm -hmm. if, if just an average you know, artist did that, you might not ever have seen it. You know? So her, her allure brought you to that. Mm -hmm. you know, well, here we are having a conversation with her. Right? Mm -hmm. That in itself, to me, is actually a great thing. Yeah. Because it brought yeah. a different viewership, too. Oh, really? okay. Another thing, too, like, if you look at it, I think it was like five or six parties where they got Martin Luther King sticking his middle fingers up, running mm -hmm. his hands, yeah, yeah. bottles, you know. And, and, and the transition of information, like I was saying, is kids that go to Malcolm X High School and they don't know who he is. Who, who job is it to make the transition to make that information identifiable? They're tampering with these images because they don't mean nothing to them. Martin Luther King don't mean nothing to them. All they know is, uh, and there's people in the world that can't believe people don't know who Malcolm X is, but all around the world they don't promote Malcolm X like they do here. All around the world it's not Martin Luther King's streets. So we can't hold the youth, and, and I'm not saying Nicki Minaj is the youth, but whatever decision she made, maybe, we gotta, we gotta understand. We know the level of what we really do behind mm -hmm. these boardrooms and, and and the level, they could have been like, oh, yeah, that'll work. That'll be real controversial. Let's do it. You know, because, you know, they say your downfall could be as big as your come up. So a lot of artists gamble on those two different types of worlds. And every artist does have a downfall. Let's be perfectly clear. So, hey, everybody does. You, you're never going to stay on the EV platform, especially in hip-hop. Yeah. But this is the glory that hip-hop, the culture, has always made me look at it. Like, if you look at it, it's not like rock, where you have... You know, Metallica, Rolling Stones, Alice in Chains, you know, what's the percentage of hip-hop groups or artists that actually get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? You can count them on two hands. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about that. Now, should there be a hip-hop Hall of Fame? Who knows? Maybe there will be at one point. Mm -hmm. But the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is the forte that, that people aspire to go to. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at, what, if you take a run DMC, you know, doing that one record, Walk this way. Yeah, walk this way. People love that record to this day. So the point is, is that we don't we don't take our music and really put it into like I don't look at Madism as just old school. I look at it as hip hop, mm -hmm. the culture of hip hop, the success of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Again, we wouldn't be sitting here without the success of the culture. So to me, the culture is always full circle. All right. As opposed to in rock, it's like this band was great for ten years. Like mm -hmm. in rock, they last like like Rolling Stones and Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. They last 30, 40, you know, years. In mm -hmm. hip hop, we've yet to see really a rising star hit that. Yeah. Well, I think it, with, with hip hop, 
there is this notion of old school, new school, right? You know, that after a, four years, really, you're old school and you're outdated. Um, where with rock and roll, you don't have that same old school music. If you're, you're successful, you're going, your fan base is going to follow you throughout. With hip hop, once your fan base matures, starts having a few kids, you get a job, it's like you leave that side of life alone and you do other things. And you don't really, it's really not about the culture mm -hmm. as much as it is about just what's hot in the now moment. Right, but the reason that is is with rock. They bring the fan base to their kids. We don't do that. Look at Mims. You know, no, 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 keep talking. After they, after the artist is hot for a minute, call me, right? we don't continuously keep bringing our kids and, and 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 their kids' friends and all that to the music. You know, Rock Hill's from right around the corner where I live. At. I live right around the border of Wine Dance in North Babylon, and you might have heard Wine Dance New York twice in his whole career. Uh, you know, now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but you know, bottom line is, is like we got to bring the fan to our music. Now, I'm going to bring Rosa into the conversation. She just hit me. She's ready. Um, folks, bear with us. Like I said, this is organic. This is Gorilla Ghetto style. You said you can't get on Skype? I cannot. I'm on a phone in a parking lot. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. So we got you here. You're, you're on the show. Say that. I'm sitting here with BG the Prophet from StarForceHipHop.com and Dash from Undeniable TV. We're having a very uh, interesting conversation about Nicki Minaj. For the first hour of our show, we dealt with social social media and the power of social media and how it translates in the hood. And that kind of led us into the Nicki Minaj conversation, um, using Malcolm X as the imagery for the single "Looking Ass Niggas." And then I, you know, I, I, I sort of introduced you to the audience, uh, told them that you put together a protest, a um, what do you call it, a um, petition. Lost it. Is that good? Yes. Hey. Hey, yeah. So I told the audience that you put together a petition uh, to protest the Nicki Minaj single, Looking Ass Niggas. So for, first, I just want you to introduce yourself and briefly tell our audience who you are so they can know, you know why your voice is so important, Rosa. Well, I'll thank you for having me. Well, my name is Rosa Clemente. I'm a black Puerto Rican chick from the Bronx. <laughs> I'm uh, currently pursuing my doctorate at UMass Amherst, and then uh, I guess a long-time community organizer and activist around a lot of issues, as well as in 2008, I ran for uh, the vice president on the Green Party ticket with Cynthia McKinney, and always grateful for brothers like Hakeem, who completely supported me before I ran and during my run. Um, yeah, and that's just a little bit about who I am. Okay, so just tell us, tell our audience, why, for you, why is Malcolm X so, so sacred? Why is he such an important figure? Well, I'm not a religious person. Um, I was raised in the Catholic Church, but I am no longer practicing like, any type of institution or religion. Um, so I always often tell people, you know, if I did have a, one God, um, I, I believe uh, more the Yoruba tradition of Odishas and, and, and priests and priestesses in that regard. That Malcolm, for me, was being my God in the sense that it was the words of Malcolm X and his speeches and his intellect, his human rights, um, his global black views that really made me an activist, that made me want to major in black studies, that made me want to pursue particularly my uh, master's at Cornell University so that I could study with Dr. James Turner, who was a very close friend of Malcolm X. Um, and as I'm attaining my PhD, for me, Malcolm is in everything I do. I write, I relate it back to him. So 
you know, we all have those people in our lives, particularly elders who have passed on, ancestors that we hold in reverence. And Malcolm is one of those people, uh, as well as some other uh, Puerto Rican brothers and sisters. Um, so any disrespect to him or they, for me, is kind of sacrilege in, in religious terms. So that's what Malcolm means to me. Okay. That particular image of Malcolm, um, standing out the window with the, with, the, with, the, with the gun, with the rifle, what does that particular image mean to you, and why do you feel it was disrespect for Nikki to use that image in promotion of a single looking ass niggas? Yeah, I mean, that picture actually hangs on my wall. It's the picture, the last picture I see, um, as well when I leave my front door, so I have it twice in my house. Um, that iconic picture of Malcolm and him defending his family, his humanity, and black people um, through the means of self-defense. And then people have to understand that Malcolm X was never, really never used violence or revolutionary violence at all, except when it came to self-defense. I think that's something that the nation of Islam has particularly taught um, black and Latino folks in America. And I come out of an organization called Malcolm X Grassroots, where our logo model is self-determination, self-defense, self-respect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all those three things made me really upset when I saw the image, because that image has been reappropriated in hip-hop before, whether it was or it's one or it's been used in magazines and it's been used respectfully. My issue with it was straight up, you do not use the N word, it's not something that I'm down with, period, but you do not use that word, put it next to his head to sell an album, to use them as a marketing tool. And I was disgusted and I just felt I had to do something about it. Wow. And, and exactly what did you do? Well, I woke up that morning, like all of us in the Northeast Coast, we all knew we were going to have a snow day. Um, Trying to think classes were canceled, my daughter was home. I happened to look on Facebook and saw a combat of mine, the room with Aunt Nelly, posted, like, oh no, like this is unacceptable. And I was like, I'm home, I'm in Amtrak, I can't get, like, with my cool people based in New York, New Jersey. I'm going to go to change.org and I'm just going to. You know, write, what, 150 words, take five minutes and say, you know, this is unacceptable. And to be honest, I was like, if 10 people find it, I'm good. You know, I didn't expect that in less than 24 hours, 2,500 people would sign it, which to me, I think it, it means a lot. I mean, in terms of people saying, like, we're not going to stand for this disrespect and this honoring of his legacy. And I'm not one that thinks petitions make revolution or change the world, but they are good tools, and I'm like, I'm here, and we have to, there are some things that are sacred in our community, right, like, that have to be sacred, like, these artists in the rap industrial complex would never dare put an image of a holocaust, mm -hmm. the Jewish holocaust, that's disrespectful, mm -hmm. um, and increasingly, they would never put on the cover something that disrespects lesbian, gay, brothers, uh, and sisters, transgender, just folks, because they understand the backlash that would their mm -hmm. careers would literally end at that moment, whether you're making a nod, you could be or whatever. The idea that you think you could disrespect Malcolm in New York, in the name of hip-hop, no. Like, no. We have to stand up for something within this culture that has been, um, Infiltrated, right? Like I said, by the rap industrial complex, mm -hmm. capitalism, and narcissism. Mm -hmm. Now, I think, in, in all fairness to yourself, I think it's important for people to know how strong a voice and activist you are when it comes to women's issues. So this is not an attack on, you know, Nicki Minaj as a woman, as if a woman can't say certain things. I, I think it's, it's important no. for folks to know that. No, not at all. And I mean, I got backlash from certain black and Latina feminists who said I was slut shaming, which is straight bull crap. Because I don't care if that has been my mother, my 
my brother, my cousin, Nicki Minaj. No. You know, and this idea particularly that women can't count political differences with women without being it called sexism or slut shaming is completely problematic, you know. Um, I mean, that, that, that discourse didn't take hold in too many circles, but this has nothing at all with Nicki Minaj being a woman. Although, as a woman, I don't find her um, like other sisters may, particularly in the academy, as a feminist icon either, you know. So, you know, I don't really even see her as a really good MC. That's just my yeah. particular take on it. Right. But, yeah, it has nothing to do with her gender. I mean, I don't care who you were. You could have been my best friend and that relationship would have ended at that moment. I now, saw that. I'm gonna also say, you know, I've I've been very supportive of you as you have been of me for close to 15 years now. Um, yeah. But you know, through our 15 years, like I, you know, I support you because I love you as my sister, and I and I know your and I know your work. Like when you when you put your heart to something, I know your heart's there. Um, but we don't we don't always agree. We have differences of, of opinion on on certain things. However, this is one thing that you and I to are, are in total agreement on. Um, how, how can I say? Um, I just think it's important for you to encourage sisters, sisters to be more active and, and have more concern about how they're represented. Because even though Nikki may think that what she is doing in terms of the choices that she makes with her career and her personal body, she may think that this is of her own volition, her own choice. The benefit ultimately goes to someone else. And yeah. uh, so if you, can, if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think first, like, um, you know, those of us who have the same politics are politically uh, aligned probably have differences in terms as it relates to tactics. Um, in terms of what? You said that again? Terms, as it relates to tactics, right? Like, tactics. how do we go about changing a situation that's already messed up? Yes. So, and I think that's important, right? Because I think um, everybody kind of plays their position and their role in terms of movement or activism and organizing. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I don't think a petition is the highest form ever of activism. I think it's the easiest and the one form we should always take because it's literally at our fingertips. It doesn't require us to have the ad permission. But as it relates to sisters, particularly within a hip-hop context, we have, obviously, there are stories that we can tell about the good stuff that many women are doing in hip-hop. I think what is missing is the political, the, the women who are really the hardcore political activists, or those of us who may choose to run for office, which is an electoral political maneuver. But um, as much as we're in it, I do want to see particularly women that are strong, that are powerful, that understand the system, that are political, that don't have to frame everything within sexuality or eroticism or pleasure, which I think is legitimately important. Like, I like to have fun. I like to go to the club. I love my man. Sex is good. Like, all that stuff is great, you know? And we should have those discussions. I also want to have discussions about politics and how politics affects women and our lives and our girls. And the larger concept of black womanism is then how does all this affect our ability to be a community along with the other gender in our lives? So, you know, that's how I see it. And that doesn't, like, ingratiate me to feminism, who a lot of people think I'm too political and not worrying enough about certain issues that it might not always go well for me when I'm dealing with brothers who are revolutionary and conscious, but still are very backward when it comes to gender and sexuality. Um, but um, I'm not occupying that position because I always think we need oppositional forces. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's missing a lot in our political discourse in our community. Like, what's the oppositional force, but also what's the, like, really radical voice that is not just, like, 
Yeah, you know, I, um, yeah. I was uh, I was on Facebook the earlier day, and Wise Intelligent had put up a post. He went bowling with his with his, his children yesterday, and he said, you know, for about a half an hour, forty five minutes, he was watching the uh, the TV screen, and they had like you know rap videos on constant rotation, and he said, yeah. of the of the thirty or more videos that were shown. Not one had a black artist in it, right? And yeah. he said you had white kids who were basically mimicking black culture. And I guess the system has figured out that they don't really need black people in hip hop anymore, right? So how this has to, right, right. How, how this relates to Nicki Minaj is that I think that black folks and our thirst for fame and our thirst for being, you know, the uh, capturing the now moment, we've sold ourselves out to the point where we have no value anymore. If we're not selling titties and ass, we're not valuable. And I think that Nikki um, continuing in that, and she's not the only one, but we don't put, a, we don't put all on her. She ain't the only one. There's a lot, a lot of brothers who are doing the very same thing. Most of our brothers. But we're devaluing, debasing ourselves to the point where we don't hold value the same way, and we're replaceable now. Now we're replaceable. Um, if you could just add on to that. Well, look, on the macro level, I, excuse me, I'm uh, so cold out here in Boston right now. I had, um, there's a sister, she's a professor at Princeton, her name is Amani Carey, and she said something really profound at a lecture last year. She said, white people prefer black sonic with black people sonically, but not visually, Ooh. right? Like, and that goes back to Steven Del Jones and culture bands, it's like, in the 50s, 60s, this was happening in music too, right? Like, um, we remember our parents' album covers being like white folks and black people singing, or like a really good documentary that speaks to this is uh, called 20 Feet from Stardom that talks about backup singers, but particularly Starling Love's story and what Phil Spector did to her and the many songs that she made that only white people sang that people who follow Darlene Love, like I didn't even know this. All that is to say that they have now perfected definitely because of social media and technology. Like, I can even sound black. Like, I can even act it. I can even, but I'm never in. So I think it goes back to what Chuck D said, what, 20, 25 years ago? Um, he, and he always asks his audience, you love hip hop, but do you love black and brown people? Mm. And you'll see people, like, especially white people, be like, what? It's like, you love this culture so much, but do you love the people that the pain comes from, the happiness, the resistance, and all that? So I think on the, that's the system level, and then you couple that with, I think something that you and some other folks were really talking about in the mid-90s, I mean, the industry, and where did the industry and these few white men who end up making this, this, these decisions. Now for me, there are people who fight that battle well, right? Like they're going at the white executive industry and all that. But to me, I, I choose to fight that by holding our people accountable mm -hmm. around that because I'm never surprised about about what white people can do. I understand the system too well. So honestly, unless you're a white person coming to me on some real, I'm about to give up all my privilege, my resources to make sure black and brown people are free. I'm not really messing with them at that regard politically at all. So I'll, how are we going to teach the babies? Like you said, like why is intelligent? He has his kids. This is why the intelligent who now has to explain to his kids, like, yo, they're just using black people, but they're never going to want you. They're just going to want literally your material production. And, and, and that's the capitalism in the system. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I think it's a hard concept for people to grapple with, Hakeem, because look at where we're at in the United States of America 20, and where most people are just trying to eat right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Really, a lot of us have privileges to the discourse go, some of us have a privilege, a college campus, all that being said, but most of our people or have a privilege of having a job, don't have that privilege. So they're not gonna, uh, not because they can't, but they got maybe a start to be big, these things are something, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and ultimately America is such a 
come down society. That is, the entertainment is what keeps people uh, uh, passive. Yeah. And we can see that in all regards. Unfortunately, the hip hop passivity affects our people and our babies, I think, the most at this point. Okay. The la last question I'm going to hit you with is um, why is the misrepresentation of Malcolm and, and all of our heroes and sheroes? Why is that dangerous when we misrepresent them? Well, I, it's dangerous because it's, it, it's like Dr. King. Um, the appropriation of their message, the appropriation of their radicalism, of their transformation, um, their assassinations both come. As Dr. King is talking about this integration has not worked, voting ain't really going to work, we need to talk about the economy, and when Malcolm talks about taking the United States to court at the United Nations over violation of black people all over the world on a human rights level. This is, this, so these men make these trans, hardcore radical political left transformations and they're assassinated in those years they made that transformation. Mm -hmm. We're not learning about it. So Dr. King has already been watered down and now, you know, on Dr. King's birthday they made commercials to sell a mattress. I, I really don't think we can allow that to happen to Malcolm. Some people will say it started happening with Spike Lee's movie. I disagree with that. Some people will say with the stamp by the United States, yes, we can have that discussion. But I think for the hip hop generation, and the ABD, I think, is oh, an amazing article, ABD.com. I mean, I think a premier hip hop journalist and archivist. Yeah, he's, on a, the ble record. he's oh, a blessing. Um, David so is a blessing. He's literally the best, right? He did a whole thing about how important Malcolm chronologically has been to the hip hop generation. Mm -hmm. And me and you are second or third, you know, hip hop generation. I'm uh, first. Mm -hmm. And, um,. We're going into the second, now my daughter's the third kind of generation that also uses politics, journalism, what she's doing, radio, where we've learned that, you know, within hip-hop, we could be multifaceted. And that same part of that multifaceted, being multifaceted, has, also has to be about having that intellectual capacity and that reverence to say, no, we're not going to let this happen to Malcolm. This is not the story. And people also said, that they think that a lot of Nicki Minaj's fans will be introduced to Malcolm in this way. And you know what? That, like, um, not scientifically, but of course there are her fans who saw that and were like, whoa, who's Malcolm X? But without any political grounding, you think they're gonna go read Malcolm's autobiography or are they gonna think Malcolm is that looking as N-I-G-G-A, right? Like, let's be real, people. You know, so I think that's, you know, why it's so critically important to preserve his historical legacy so it's not watered down, reappropriated, and sold back to, you know, my daughter's generation. Yeah. Hey, Rose, I want to thank you tremendously for joining us. You've added so much to this conversation. Um, we got to get you in here live and direct. So we'll figure out when you're going to be in the New York area so we can put a camera on you and we're going to, you know, create another conversation. Because the, po the, the folks out there will definitely do well in listening to your jewels. So, I want to... Well, thank you for having me, and I'm so glad you're using this type of medium. And, of course, when I'm in New York, you're like the first people me and Justice are going to come visit. So, please do, please thank do. You. Tell Just I said peace. Peace to God. I will. All right. I'll tell him that exactly right now. Yes, yes. All right, will you do your thing? Thanks for calling in. I'll talk to you real soon. All right, thank you so much, Hakeem. Peace. I love you, brother. Love Take you, too. Care. Peace, brother. All right. So, yeah, let's call in. I put the call in numbers 862-588-5729. We want to hear from you. But until you do, let's hear from our man, BG, the prophet. Do you want to add on to what Rosa just said? I mean, the way I see it, she used the key word I brought up, narcissism, mm -hmm. which is definitely a key factor. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's just, we, 
aren't learning what's right in school anyway. Mm -hmm. You can go back to when I, I graduated in 93, and I can tell you for a fact, in the mid-80s up to the 90s, all the history books were lies. Mm -hmm. You know, has that changed? Is it changing? You know, we don't look ahead 50, 60 years to what the detriments are of what we're going through now. You know, and by that, 30 years from now, we'll see what the Afghan war and these wars have had on us. With this situation here, and she touched on it, you know, you have this, this culture that has benefited by an icon. Mm -hmm. But now the kids don't know the meaning of that icon. Mm -hmm. And without us, older folk, to, to, to tell them and, and bring that into the lives of these young kids, I don't know, I fear that all icons might mm -hmm. suffer that type of abuse. You know, let me keep one hundred. Right, just keep it 100. Like we met on Facebook, mm -hmm. right? And you know, you started following my, my, my content because you know, I, I'm getting conscious. It's political, it's conscious, it's religious. And you having a certain background, certain things resonated, right? Mm -hmm. um, and from that, we kind of developed, I wouldn't call it a business relationship, but we've been mutually supportive in each other's business, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Um, one thing that I get from you is that you're genuine in your hip hop walk. Right, and you don't, you do things that you don't necessarily have to do. As it pertains to what Rosa said in terms of white folks in hip hop, mm -hmm. how could you address white people, especially youngsters, who are getting into the culture and impress upon them the importance of maintaining truth to the culture? Well, you know, oddly enough, I wouldn't recommend that to a young white culture at all unless they knew the history. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to know the history is by some elder or OG, let's say, mm -hmm. to teach you or tell you what the music was like then. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm from upstate New York originally. I came to, to Long Island in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. And it was like 84. And my dad was a you know was an ex piper in the house. Mm -hmm. He hated hip hop. He hated the white glove, he hated the break dancing, you know. But that's but the black culture embraced me always. Mm -hmm. Whether I was graffiti writing or whether I got into rapping or, or music, the whole culture itself. Mm -hmm. But now, that culture has changed so much. Like she said, the capitalistic companies have actually changed the way it functions. Mm -hmm. Billion dollar industry, who's making the billions? It ain't the rappers. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, it's, you see where I'm going with that? It's, it's the corporations that are selling to you know, to, to the masses. Mm -hmm. Now, oddly enough, white people buy albums. I have, and, and this is a fact, it's been done. Mm -hmm. If you go to country music, the reason that these people can sell albums is because when you go to the checkout line at Walmart, and you don't have to have a parental advisory sticker on your product. But we, because we want to break down the barriers and have freedom of speech, at some point we have to also take in what is the limit. Mm -hmm. And throughout this whole conversation, then we've touched on it several times, you know. As to what's who's culpable, you know, Dash had touched on, you know, uh, as far as the site's content and, and how do we hold that account? Mm -hmm. You know, to this specific conversation, though, the, 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 the white people now are different than when they were first introduced to hip hop. Then, in other words, in the '80s, you had white kids that were coming from like rock backgrounds, mm -hmm. and hip hop was still developing because it was so new. Mm -hmm. Now. It's all about drugs in your face. Do you see a see, whole? I, see, I, see I, that's, the, that's the thing. That's not hip hop. Like drug culture is not hip hop. Drug culture is drug culture. Exactly right. Drug yeah. culture exists in hip hop like drug culture exists in yeah, baseball. Yeah. Exactly. Drug yeah, culture yeah. exists in football. Yeah. Drug culture, like you know, gangsterism exists on all levels of American society, right? Hip hop, we say hip hop, we talk about peace, love, unity, Safety having fun, graffiti writing, MC, breakdance, DJ, knowledge, mm -hmm. right? That's hip hop as it is expressed by blacks, browns, and poor white people, right? That's hip hop. The co corporate would like us to think that hip hop culture is the violence, the drugs, mm -hmm. the because hip hop has become such a commercial term that to keep people locked in, in this low vibrational state, we're gonna take hip hop and tie it to all these low vibrational activities. Mm -hmm. When 
People are still break dancing. People are still doing graffiti art, being artistic. People are still rapping. People are still DJing. People are still practicing the true elements of hip hop, but we don't even respect it like that. Anymore. But it's not shown. But it's not shown. So it's kind of up to us to say, you know what? I'm not saying that you shouldn't do drugs. I'm not saying that you shouldn't bust your gun. I'm not saying you shouldn't play the knockout game. I'm not saying that you shouldn't pop a bottle. What I'm saying is that in and of itself is not hip hop. That is what it is. Yes, people in hip hop culture do those things, but that in and of itself is not hip hop. Mm -hmm. And that if we want to maintain hip hop culture, we just have to learn how to separate it from what it is not. Right? Mm -hmm. well, uh, yeah, um, just talk about this point. You know, when it comes to judging inspiration, when it comes to judging inspiration, when, when my son looked at video games, when my son played his toys, when Batman inspired him, when Spider-Man inspired him, when quote-unquote white heroes inspired him, who are we to say um, it needs to be a black face on the superhero for him to be inspired? Uh, who are we to dictate the message of inspiration? Mm -hmm. Meaning, let's say, I can't remember my name, 67? 65. 65. So, say Malcolm X died. That was the big move, that was the big push. But he wasn't an education man because he was still pursuing and pursuing his name. So, let's say the movie accumulated and hit whatever point million people. When was the last time Malcolm X ever trained around the world? Yeah. When is the last time Malcolm X ever hit 20 point whatever million people on the internet at one time? If it wasn't for Nikki, then how would his name ever not spread? Right. Even for, if it is education, if it's for educational reasons. <clears throat> First time I heard Malcolm X, I think, was public enemy, but I didn't listen to him or understand his message. I heard the name, then when I seen the movie, then it resonated, and then I did the research. But nobody told, I still heard hip hop, I heard the name. And I was when I heard the name, I couldn't even read at, the point, at right. that point. So it's the same thing about we don't know what inspiration is into a land and a person that inspires. Right. So we can have to say it, present it however she wants. But is what that name trend, that name hit millions of people on Google, hit millions of people around the world. Our educational system is not doing that. I don't care who radical, no radical person, even first kind, I don't think making Malcolm X go trending and hit a trend yeah. and top of the go viral. Here's his own. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Ron, we got people who are commenting in the chat. I think they're asking questions too. I just got a, a message. Just check it for me. Maybe you can read the question off. But hope for more of what I want to address. Dash. It's not so much that um, he trends mm -hmm. or a million people know him, right? If a million people know him out of context, it means nothing that you know him. But either way, I know you don't know about context now. Because your context is your understanding. A thought, a thought in your head 10 years ago is not the same thought in your head now. You grew and matured with that thought. My words only mean your understanding. Watch the point. Mm -hmm. The conversation yesterday on BLS, we had a teacher who would ban any written work mm -hmm. from the students regarding Malcolm X, mm -hmm. right? She said that she went to one website and based on the information she got from one website is the reason why she made her decision to not allow him to. So your context that you see something in now determines how you accept it and how you express it. So you have a million people who see this image out of context and that's how they process it, right? That's how they process it. What's important about Malcolm X is not this. What's important about Malcolm X is his ideas, his philosophy, his activism, and how he related to the world it, it, around it, it, him. And what you just said, this is a teacher, this is an educator that's not educated enough on who Malcolm X is, his story. Well, we're all teachers. This is dialogue. We're all teachers. Definitely. But even in that sense, but she, she's a teacher with teachers with an organized setting, meaning we teach. We are in charge of these children's minds. We're implanting the curriculum in their brain. You know? So that point to saying um, 
these kids are leaving with her ideas, her reality, her world. And the same thing. Like my, my son know about everybody. My son goes to school and they come tell him, oh, them people are this. Them people, and he's a teacher. He's an educator that live in our community. He's a black teacher that should know and they don't know. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, the name, the name, the logo, the logo, boom. Let me ask you a question, mm -hmm. right? Did you put up content on your site that just re that put the Jewish Holocaust placed it out of context. That's always in uh, perception. That's in the perception. The, the Box had a record, the Benjamin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Said um, we stack chips like Hebrews. Mm -hmm. They were forced to edit that. But Biggie had a record, right? He said. Um, to my niggas in the blue suits, I make it prove that it's bulletproof. You had, to, you had to edit that why. But look, and that's the same reason Kramer got dashed in his career for saying nigga. Whenever the opposite complained, it's like Jews, this Jew, blah, whatever. If black people did black people, most of the time it's not. Mm -hmm. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not talking about we're not talking about black people this no, no. and Jew. We're exactly. talking about exactly. a commercial product. We're not talking about freedom of speech. We're talking about a commercial product. Product, mm -hmm. Someone making money off of the degradation of something. Mm -hmm. When it comes to other cultures, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. When it comes to black people, you can do it at one. These are black people with black people. It's not like a white person. No, 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 Universal, mm -hmm. Vivendi. Well, look, that 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 that, that, that that's who gets final say. No, but, 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 no, but this wasn't that album cover when it comes to viral and just creating. Sometimes the artist, you know, I'm sure we all know that artist want to keep that buzz before they even get their budget money. Let's do this. Let's spend. Let's get this money and let's just do this right now. So the label probably didn't even approve that. That probably went up and went viral before that got approved. We just assumed, it. but. My whole point is, Nicki is not ever, and I challenge you, Nicki Minaj. Yeah, of course. I want to, I want to yeah, see you course. do a record with some starving ass Jews in Nazi Germany yeah. and see what happens. Yeah. I bet you you won't do it. Yeah. I got, I got, I, I bet you you won't do it. So it don't, you can't go. Well, we, but it's okay it's, for us to do it here, but, but we can't do it there. It's just like, it's just like third time, and he speak the true context, and he. he but you know, not to cut yeah, you, not to cut you off. But here's the thing that transcends it all. If you look at what trended today, Malcolm trended, yeah. which means the first thing that came up was his wiki page. Yeah, but but no, hear me. But, 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 people that, but people that study that, but when you study Malcolm X, not everyone's going to. Dude, if you study, if you were, if you were, if you were to study Malcolm X, right, you would see he wouldn't give a flying fuck about the wiki. No, like no, that, him trending, that. him that. trending ha, ha, is so ha, ha, ha. contrary to what he stood for. He didn't care about trending. He cared about standing on principle. Oh, so if, if it's really about promoting Malcolm X, you have to promote what he stood for, Absolutely. not just his but, image. But the thing is, is that if someone would have the brain power that we have, took that the right way in the wiki page, they might have learned something today. And look, and also And hopefully they learned something today. Also, we are all at a level where we understand we where we're enlightened. We we have the mind power, we research, we understand. So at the end of the day, if you have a message and it, and it doesn't go to people who need it, you don't have a message. Because we get it. But how do you get it to the people that don't get it? Mm. You you ever hear it the saying, I'd rather have Five or ten mm -hmm. of the right people than a million of the wrong Absolutely. people. Absolutely. Okay, so that's what we, it's like. Well, that's something. Not, I think that's different. And, and, and where if you drive in a car, I want a person that know how to drive. I don't want somebody that don't know how to drive. But at the end of the day, the passenger play a position. The people in the back seat got a position. We if we're talking about a culture, what makes you a culture? A culture is if you're born, you raise your children a certain way. They follow your culture and your morals. Same way we look at the communities in the society right now. These kids are cultureless. They ain't following nothing. They ain't following no religion, no ideas, no ideology. They just whole new things. Because, because the right people 
is bitches and won't take a goddamn stand. No, but it's not about Look, that. niggas will protest Rick Ross and shut his concert down, but you can shoot a black kid in Florida and ain't nobody got nothing to say. But look, but look. Because no, no, no. What, what makes us, what makes us human? Right now, you can shoot me, I can shoot you, but what's in you will say, no, that's not right. Your, your heart, your mind, the level that you think. So a kid that will walk up and shoot you and blow your brains out and go eat chicken right after that, something in him is missing. He can't perform to the thinking capacity that you can perform to. Mm -hmm. So he's missing data, he's missing the culture, he's missing the morals. So it's not about wrong or right, but you're here to get the old people, they rather sit on a porch and judge. Oh, these young people today, they're going to hell. Okay, the young people today are going to hell because y'all are afraid to reach and touch them and give them the information. Same thing. I'm the kid that we talking about. I didn't know how to read, write, graduated with a diploma, I couldn't read. I guessed my whole life. If I would have met the wrong person, my life would have just been there. I mm -hmm. met a Jehovah Witness and said, do you know who Jehovah is? No. I didn't know. She so did Bible study with me for two years. Taught me a religion, taught me how to believe, taught me how to read. I found love. I got love. I raised my son. My son know what the Bible message says, love, his history. That's the culture that was passed down. But that's the same reason the iPhone, with you. that's the same reason, with you. Really, that, that's the same reason that Apple could put out the same phone and resell the same phone for a higher price because they're putting a the different data in that phone. Yeah, exactly so right, yeah. we as cultural people, yes, we got the same bodies. Yes, you brown, I'm brown, but we ain't the same. I, I, <laughs> you are for a focus, I'm a bit mentally. So the four folks yeah. don't know he can, can't blow your yeah. brains out. When I, when I, when I, when I, you know, I grew up in the nation, right? Early, early, early on in the nation, right? Came out. This is after Malcolm had passed, right? Um, so, you know, I heard of Malcolm, I knew of Malcolm, but didn't know Malcolm, right? Went to college, some of my older classmates put me on to Malcolm. I went home, found a book on about Malcolm X, which was in my mother's library my whole life had never read it. Finally got into reading Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And from that, triggered, and I got into Malcolm X, right? Was yeah. able to yeah. put him in a context to where he means something more than just this, mm -hmm. right? That studying Malcolm's life inspired me, not just me, inspired a lot of people to become active participants in their own liberation. Mm -hmm. Because when you get into him and you see him go from Detroit Red all the way up, you see yourself in his life. You see your life story in his life story. So hopefully, as we close this out, the discussion that Nicki Minaj has sparked will inspire folks to go deep into the life of Malcolm X, to see his transformation, to see what his politics was, throughout his lifetime, especially right before he died, when his political ideology had, was at its most mature. We got to cut it short, though. We've been doing this for 10 plus hours. I really appreciate you all out there in YouTube land for hanging on with us. My name is Hakeem Green. This is BG the Prophet Peace. from StarForceHipHop.com. Look the brother up because he's doing big things. Dash from Undeniable TV. Check the YouTube channel. Check him at UndeniableTV.net. Um, yeah, we're going to be back here next week, and we're going to have something live and direct. Actually, we might be here on Friday. We, we good Friday, Rozelle? You don't know yet? Maybe, possibly. But I just want to give a shout-out to my homegirl, Malkia King, a.k.a. Milk. Um, she's putting together an event on, an event on Friday, this coming Friday on the 21st, in honor of the mothers of Trayvon Martin, Ramali Graham, Jordan Davis, the Central Park Five. All of the mothers are going to be at this event held on 43rd Street in New York City. And I'm hoping that we'll be there to cover it. So stay tuned. I'll hit you on Twitter. I'll hit you on Facebook and let you know how that's going. If you don't see me on Friday, you'll definitely see me next Monday. My name is Hakeem. Say that, say that, say that. Peace.